Well, good morning, church. I know I get a little loud. Sorry, I apologize. It is great to be here. Um, and I'm always excited when Josh uh, asks me to come and speak to you guys. Uh, it's almost a year that my wife and I and our family, our two boys, have been on the East Coast. And so it's, it's, it's pretty crazy to think of it. I think about it. I still don't know where I'm at. Um, <laughs> I trust Google like Jesus. I'm just, hey, he gets me lost. Like, I don't know. If I'm trapped, so I don't know. I'm trusting that the direction is going to get me to where I got to go. I do know that this is South Jersey, though, right? It's not North. It's not Central, which I hear Central doesn't really exist, but this is South Jersey. Uh, so I'm getting to know uh, different things, but it's been so beautiful. I, just even the drive coming over, I know the bridge name, Walt Whitman. I think, I think that's what I crossed. Um, and thank you. I got thumbs up. But just the trees and, 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 um, and you make, wow, the trees. There's not a lot of green uh, in different parts of California, depending on where you are. And I show this a lot with people that when you see green, for me, you know, I, I didn't realize how much California is a desert till you come out here. When you see green, it's usually a sign of wealth. You know, it's like golf courses or really nice places. I'm driving around. I'm like, in the city, it's like green coming out of concrete. I'm like, this is crazy. And, and so and my wife's like, honey, honey, stop it. I'm like driving. I'm like, I feel like I'm in Disneyland. I'm just, I'm so taken aback by the force. And when I drive here, I see even so much more coming into uh, South Jersey. You know, our theme this year is deeply rooted in, um, for you city, that's where I, uh, the congregation I oversee, over, oversee at the time with my wife, and we have been going through the parables. Uh, and I know, I think you guys have been going through the book of Luke. I don't, I'm not too sure. I, I think so. And if you're like, I don't know what we're going through, amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out of Luke 12. So you can go there, Luke 12. But what's been really good about going through the parables is just looking at Jesus' teachings. In the next couple of months for you, city, we want to be deeply rooted in Jesus. We're going to focus on his teachings, focus on his parables, focus on what Jesus wants for our lives. And that's what we're going to look at in Luke 12. We're going to break down the, par the parable of the rich fool. And I don't know if the last time you looked at that parable. It's a great uh, parable just to talk about our hearts and what we give our hearts to. And how all in or invested are we with God. Um, I like moving my arms around. I like interaction. So feel free to say a hallelujah. Come on, bro. I, I love it all. Um, just to get you excited and get, and get, get going in the service. Uh, so you should be there in Luke 12. Uh, the, I'm reading the NIV. Um, I, I love to, to mention the different translations. I'm a translation snob, and I read all types of translations. We'll be in uh, NIV uh, for this morning. And we'll pick up in verse 13 of Luke chapter 12. You guys there? Can I get an amen? amen. There we go. I love it. Uh, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me to judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to him, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear, tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it would be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. And we'll stop there. This is a very convicting passage. Uh, if you, and when we start to dig uh, deeper into the passage, you'll get what I'm saying here. Now, for the past couple of years, I've been on my own little journey into just Jewish culture and, and, and Jewish thought and trying to get more of a, a full background of the Old Testament. And um, I, I'm sure Josh may have mentioned a podcast called Bema. Uh, there's some great books that I've been reading uh, lately, like Sitting at the Feet of Jesus, um, uh, Jesus Through the Middle Eastern Eyes, two great books, uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. These are great books to get me out of my Western thinking, out of my American thinking. 
and to dive into the audience of Jesus' time in the ancient times yeah. and what they thought about these parables, what they thought about Scripture, how, what they thought about Jesus. And that's what we're going to do with this parable. Now, Jewish teaching is set up for you to look for buried treasure. A rabbi will, will, will say things that can seem obscure. And he's testing the, his audience. He's testing his students, his Talmudim. Look for the answers. Look for the pearls. And, and, it, and it's a refer, reference to a scripture that Jesus mentions to his disciples when he says, hey, this is why I speak, par, speak in parables. And it always confused me. I don't have the reference off, off the top of my head. But you can search for it where he says, I speak in parables that those seen will see, and the, or those seen will not see, and those here will not hear. And it almost seems like he's trying to confuse people. And I always, I was like, Jesus, don't you want to teach people? Why are you being obscure? But he's just being a rabbi. Because his thought is, if you really love God, if you really love God's word, then you'll search for the answers. And all I got to give you is a reference, and you do the digging. Because that shows your heart. Yeah. And so I'll throw out some reference even in the sermon, and you're going to go back and study it. You have your time to go back and study it. Yeah. We should be engaging in God's word. Yeah. And so what's cool about the parables, there's buried treasure all over it. And we'll talk about a couple of things. Most parables, if not all of them, point to a passage in the Old Testament that Jesus wants his audience to go back and search for and find the connecting truth. You know, this is a quote from one of the rabbis. He talks about the Talmud, which has all the Jewish traditions and, and, uh, and commentary about the Old Testament. He says, the Talmud teaches us, to arg teaches us that argument, discussion, disagreement, and diverse viewpoints are critical if the Torah, which is the Old Testament, the first five books, is to take root and to grow in our lives. Rabbis had the goal to argue with their students. If you're not arguing the scriptures with me, then you're not learning. You can't defend yourself. What about us? How well do you dig and learn and read the scriptures? So when you look at this passage, there should be some, you should be questioning it. Like, why is this? Why is that? Any passage that you read. Why did he say it this way? Why did he reference this? Where is this going? What's his aim? What's Jesus' goal? And here's some of the questions that come to me when I think of the passage. First couple questions here. Um, you know, why does Jesus jump into the parable from the question that he gets from this guy? This guy says, hey, divide my property with my brother. Tell my brother to divide the, the inheritance with me, Jesus. And he's like, who are you? And then he gets right into a parable about greed. Why does he do that? What does he make, uh, why does he make the point that he is not the judge or arbiter of, of this guy? I thought he came to judge. Why did he make that? Is it bad to build wealth? We'll answer that. <laughs> She's like, no, I love the engagement. Come on. She's like, no. Um, is it bad? Well, let's look into the scriptures. And what does it mean to be rich towards God? We're going to talk about that. Are you ready to dig in? Yeah. Put on your hard hats. Let's go. We're going to go through each scripture and we're going to squeeze out the hidden gems. Dig for the hidden gems of each scripture. So let's start in verse 13. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me to judge an arbiter between you? Now, in Jesus' day, the audience would, would understand Jesus' frustration at this guy for a couple of reasons. One, he does not address this man formally. In the, the, the text and in the context, him saying man is a very rough way to address a person. It's a very disrespectful way to address a person. So he's already frustrated about this guy. But why? This guy comes not to learn about spiritual things. He wants advice on money. He wants advice on his inheritance that selfishly benefits him. And he treats Jesus like his own personal servant. Hey, you go tell my brother to do this. And Jesus is like, man, who, who are you? That's what it would translate to. Who are you? Who, who stands before me? Why am I your personal lawyer? Go handle your own business. I'm preaching about God's kingdom. And you can see that again in, in the frustration when Jesus um, addresses this guy. But my question for us is, how do we approach Jesus? 
What are your prayers like? What do you beg for before God? Amen. Do you flood your prayers with selfish concerns? Or are your prayers are like, God, your will be done. I'm glad that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wasn't praying selfish prayers. He said, hey, if there's another way, but if not, may your will be done. He laid himself before God. Are you concerned about things that only benefit yourself? You know, I heard a, a quote one time, one of the, the, the ministers that I heard the sermon, he said, sometimes God can be this cosmic vending machine that we, I went, see, 12, you know, and we're waiting for this prayer to happen, right? And, and the younger, like, audience, like, vending machine, like, what is that? Okay, or like an ordering service from Amazon, right? Yeah. Or an Uber, right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to be relevant. Re relevant. <laughs> but we can, we can think of God as, as this ordering service. I'll order, I'll put my order in, I'll wait for it, and if it doesn't come, and now I get frustrated. I'm calling customer service. God, what's happening? I ordered this like three weeks ago. I wanted prosperity three weeks ago. I wanted a boyfriend or girlfriend three months ago. Where is it? God doesn't do, the, he doesn't work that way. It's not like same day delivery for your prayers. Just because you want it that bad. God doesn't bend to your will. We bend to his. And that's what Jesus is trying to get this guy to see. You know, Felipe had preached that at our congregational service where, and I'm so at fault with this, where I can be judgmental of the songs that we sing in worship or who speaks. Oh, this guy's speaking. This is going to be great. Instead of, I'm coming here to worship God. I don't care who gets up there. If no one gets up there, I'm still going to worship God. I'll hop up there to help people worship God. That I'm here to serve and not to get my own needs met. But what is the proper way to worship? Turn over to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. You guys still with me? Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. What is the right way and the proper way to worship? And uh, this is one of my core conviction scriptures here that, that I really uh, strive to fulfill. And uh, verse 1 of Romans chapter 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spirit, your true and proper worship. You know, I, I'm, I'm going back and forth in different translations. But this is what our true and proper worship is. Being a living sacrifice. Not caring how the worship is structured or what songs are sung or who preaches or who's there. Or if, if I'm going to get my needs met or not. I'm to come before God as a living sacrifice. God, do what you will. Do I need to stay after to talk to so-and-so because they need encouragement? I'll do it. Do I need to move plans around to help this person see their destiny and become a Christian? I'll do it. The church needs to, to give more money to help whatever mission work? I'll do it. I'm a living sacrifice. And I heard one of the commentators says, a living sacrifice is a sacrifice on the altar that continually dies. It, it needs to be continually killed. Because it keeps trying to crawl off the altar. And you got to keep putting it back up there every morning and killing it again. That's at least how I feel. You're like, bro, that's morbid. Well, that's how I feel in the morning when I got to wake up in the morning before my kids get up because I'm doomed if I don't. <laughs> and so I'm like, 5.30 seems to be so far away from me to grasp. And I've got to, I got to be a living sacrifice in order to be the, the husband I need to be for my family. I need to be a living sacrifice to be the, the evangelist, the minister that I need to be for the church. If I don't, I get swallowed up. And then I get to be selfish, and I'm like this guy. Hey, Jesus, can you, can you fix my problems? Instead of coming to give and fellowship, coming to give to worship God. Amen? Amen. Let's keep reading. That's just the first two verses. Let's get, let's keep reading. Because I don't have a lot of time here. Unless you want to be here for three hours. And amen to that. Living sacrifice. All right. 
<laughs> no, I was playing. I was playing. It's like, bro, I don't know about that. Uh, 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus exposes this guy's motives. We're at Luke 12, verse 15. He exposes this guy's motives. He's saying, you're letting your wealth and your possessions divide your family. Obviously, he's got issues with his brother. I don't know what's going on in the household, but he's got issues with his brother. And some scholars say this is kind of a, a prequel to the prodigal son. What if this is the story, the parable that this is based off of? This guy wanting inheritance from his younger brother, right? I thought that was cool. I'm like, wow, what a nugget there. This guy prioritizes possessions over his relationships. That's pretty wacky to do that. To consider things that are, that are man-made or created over actual people, human beings. Well, verse 16, let's continue to read. And then he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And we're, stop, we're going to stop here. There's a lot of stuff chock full here. What we find out is this guy is already rich. Why does he need more? It says a rich man had produced a good crop. Now, a good crop means, obviously, that that, uh, that year, that season, he had a lot of growth from his, his crop. Is that by his energy or by God's? So Jesus gives you a hint saying, you had a good crop. Your blessing wasn't even from you. God was God-given. If you look at ancient times, farmers were beholden to the elements, to the weather. They were very dependent people, very humble people because of their profession. If it was a drought that year, you were, you were messed up. And God's like, you had a good crop that wasn't even from you. That was a blessing from God. And you took it to exploit it. You took it for your own advantage. Jesus is digging into this dude. This dude is like, I shouldn't have asked him that question. I should have went, I should have went to my lawyer. You know, why did I talk to the rabbi? But hey, this is what happens. You, you, you come across Jesus that way, you get discipled. Verse 17, let's continue to read. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Now, the audience in Jesus' day, we'll, we'll take a stop here. The audience in Jesus' day would find this guy to be a very, in a very sad situation. And the re reason being is when he had to have a major decision to make, who did he go to? He went to no one. He went by himself. In the, in, in the Middle East culture, you make big decisions with your family and friends. This is a huge decision. This guy is either alienate himself from everyone that he, that he loves or knows or, or they're all are gone. And he has no one to consult with. And he only is left to his thoughts. He's only left to what he thinks is right. Again, in Middle Eastern culture, families, communities, villages are tightly knit together. Everybody's business is everybody's business. And I don't know if you have a family like that, it's frustrating to live in a family like that, but it's also comforting to live in a family like that. Because I know that I'm not going to fall between the cracks. Someone's going to reach out to me. Hey, I heard you said this to your brother. How did you, who told you? Go reconcile, you know, uh, not a family will say that, go reconcile. No, go, go, go make, it, make it better. Talk to him. Call your brother. Love up on him. Who do you consult to make big decisions? Do you have a community of spiritual people, Christians, to help you with your decisions? Or do you make a lot of your decisions thinking to yourself, I think this is right. I don't care how smart you are, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but you need a community. Because you can't see all your blind spots. We need people in our lives to help us, to guide us. This guy finds himself in a very, very sad situation. Let's continue to read. Verse 19, it says, Then I say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And we'll stop here. This guy has a twisted view on purpose. He thinks my God-given right is to enjoy life. 
to eat, drink, and be merry. There's a quote from a scholar that, that talks about this particular passage. He was a Middle Eastern scholar. He says, this guy imagines that a person created in the image of God can be fully satisfied with food for the body. That is the, that is the highest pleasure and greatest form of satisfaction is eating and drinking. That is pretty sad. That my purpose here on this earth is to satisfy myself. There's a lot of people in the world today, they think that way. And then they wonder, man, I, I've got all this money. Why am I still feeling the way I feel? Or I got the relationship that I want or the person that, that looks the way I want them to look. Why am I still empty? Or why are we fighting? It's supposed to be perfect. Or I have kids and, and I got it. The 2.5 kids that I want, and, and they're crazy. They don't listen to me. What is going on here? That precious baby is now talking back to you. A lot. I'm hitting some chords there. Because that's not the purpose. It's not to satisfy ourselves. And God will continue to put you in a situation until you see that. We are put here for God. And he created us so he knows how our lives should be. He knows how to direct our lives. You know, turn over to Ecclesiastes. This is, this is the, the hidden treasure. This is what I believe, and in, 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 in reading some other scholars, that believe that Jesus was pointing to this passage for his audience. Ecclesiastes 3. And we'll pick up in verse 9. And the, and the way you can get the hints that there'll be the same phrases that you'll, you'll read in the, the parable, or, or, or the, maybe there's a word that connects with another word, or the context is fitting, because most people in ancient time, or, or, or most Jews, would know this Old Testament passage. And this is what they believe that Jesus was pointing to uh, in the parable. You guys there? Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verse 9. Let's go. It says, What does a worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to, uh, to end. Verse 12, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. That everyone may, here's that phrase, eat and drink and find what? Satisfaction. And all his toil. But, but here's where the guy left out. This is from who? God. This is a gift from God. That's why we are to, to enjoy our lives, because it's a gift from God. He gives it to us. And 14 is the culmination. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added, nothing take away from it. God does it so that men would do what? Revere him. He has blessed you so you can look back to him. This guy missed it. And this is the hidden treasure. God, Jesus is trying to communicate to the audience like, hey, this guy missed it. And you will too. If you think life is to satisfy yourself, your life has been given to God. Your life is to be to please God. And he wants you to enjoy it. That's getting back to your, yeah, yes, he wants us to, to eat, drink, and be merry. But in honor of him. Our lives to honor him and not to live selfishly. Let's end in verse 20. Are you guys still with me? Let's see. It's, it's a cliffhanger. Let's see how the parable ends. Verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? And we'll stop there. This guy was, was on his own program. He was doing his own thing. And then suddenly he died. And God, and now he stands before God. And God says, your life is demanded from me now. And that's a strange phrase. In, in the context, some of the, the, the scholars I was reading talked about that this Greek phrase is, is like, um, it's like real estate language. Meaning that this guy's life was on loan to God. And now he's coming to demand it back. And he says, hey, what have you done with your life? And all this guy can focus on was himself and his own personal wealth. Our lives are on loan for God. Yes. What are you doing with your life? I don't care how healthy or health nut you are. 
I was I will give you maybe a hundred years to live. To, to live to be a hundred. And say you're really healthy, maybe you can push 120. And maybe you really, 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 and you got 121, right? Think of that, 121, 100 whatever years in the scope of eternity. It's just a speck. And if you believe that God has created the universe, he has put you here, and for us to honor him, your 120 years compared to eternity is nothing. And that, again, I'm, I'm saying this to myself, I'm a big tech nut, that iPhone and the scale of eternity is nothing. That house that you want to save for in a scale of eternity is nothing. And the decisions you make now will have an impact for eternity. Where you're going to spend the most of your, your life. Now you're like, hey, I don't believe in all that. Then please study the Bible. I plead with you to study the Bible. And let us convince you of who God is. But for those who do believe that, what are you doing with your life? I want to read you a quote. It's from Steve Jobs. Like I said, I'm a tech nut. Steve Jobs is like amazing. He had passed years ago. And this is a quote from Steve Jobs. Billionaire. Created Apple. Changed everything that we do about the world. App stores and, and iPod, MP3s. The whole thing. Smartphone. Which I'm sure majority of us have. He was one of the creators for these things. Or at least the idea, uh, the, the motivator to, to push for technology and innovation. This is him on his deathbed, dying of cancer. This is what he says. He says, I've reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. In others' eyes, my life is the epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy. In the end, wealth is only a fact of life that I'm accustomed to. At this moment, lying sick in bed and recalling my whole life, I realized that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of impending death. In darkness, I look at the green lights from my life support machines that I hear humming and mechanical sounds. I feel the breath of God and of death drawing closer. Now I know when we have accumulated sufficient wealth to last our lifetime, we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. Should be something that is more, should, there should be something that is more important. Perhaps relationships, perhaps art, perhaps a dream from younger days. Non-stop pursuing of wealth will only turn a person into a twisted being just like me. Wow. This guy was successful. This guy had it all. He's changed, literally changed the world that we live in. The iPhone is up there as, as it's, it's, it's up there as a, the a top 10 of the most transformational inventions in human history. And yet he is on his deathbed clinging to his life. And he didn't make it. And the only thing he can think of is his regrets. Wealth didn't bring him anything. Notoriety didn't bring him anything that was fulfilling. He's lying scared, scared, and regretful of the things that he, that he made. This is coming from a man who, I mean, more successful than I am in a world standpoint, feeling this way. What are you doing with your life? God could call it back from you. He could demand it today. Who knows? What are we doing with our lives? That is why I got into the ministry. And it wasn't because I had nothing better to do. I had great options. I got my degree in graphic design. I wanted to go to Hollywood and, 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 and design movie posters. And, and I actually wanted to be a director and do a lot of entertainment stuff. And, and, and I still love those things. I watch movies and I'm like, that's great. And I know friends and, 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 and uh, uh, classmates that are in the entertainment industry are working on gaming, doing some crazy and amazing things. And sometimes I could struggle with that when I see their lives and the wealth and those things. But then I, then I come to my senses like the prodigal son. Amen. This is the best job in the world. Amen. And it may, on the outside, may not, you can clap for that. I feel that way. I am put in position to always see the spiritual need. 
people say like, wow, like, why are you in the ministry? Is it do it's not to preach. In fact, uh, most times I'm, I'm always terrified to speak. Um, it's not to preach. It's because I, God forces me into a place that I have to give. He puts me in a position where the spotlight is on me, not to, not to do great things, but for me to be righteous in his eyes. And I love it. I love it. I love every moment of it. And, and whether, where it takes me, I don't know. I'm here. Yeah. Right? And, and who knows? But I know that this is what I want for my life. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Now, you don't have to be in the ministry to, 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 to feel that. If you call yourself a Christian, you've been given so much. You're rich. Not only if you're rich, he's giving you a good crop. Don't go exploiting it. Don't waste your time chasing after what your neighbor's doing. Because I guarantee you, if you were to open the window to their house, they are crazy and fighting and doing all kinds of stuff. Right? And you're like, they got bigger borns. And you're like, who cares? I love my wife. I love to go to sleep at night and I think she's going to stab me in my sleep. That's worth a billion dollars. Am I right? Okay? I'm just saying. Google it. There's a lot of drama out there in marriages. No, actually, don't Google it. Okay. So what does Jesus want to get out of this? Let's end here. You guys, I, mean, I think I'm going over my time. I don't even know where I'm at. Okay. Let's, let's, let's end with Luke 12. And we're going to read 22 through 31. This is what Jesus is pointing to. And it's cool because we always read these collection of verses, but we don't marry it in, in, in Luke to the parable. This is his commentary, and this is what he wants to leave us with. It's a very familiar passage if you read uh, on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew, I believe, 6, talks about this. But Luke 12, verse 22, this is Jesus' culmination. So Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Here's that phrase. What you eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. Do not sow or reap. Not store, uh, they, they have no storeroom or a barn. There's that barn, that phrase. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable, valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about all the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor. Again, that connects to Ecclesiastes. He was the author of, of Ecclesiastes. And all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. It's a faith issue on this guy's part. He doesn't believe he's going to be taken care of by his brother, his family. So he's just like, I want to get mine. In verse 29. And so do not set your heart on what you will eat or what you will drink. That phrase comes up again. Do not worry about it. For, pagan, for the pagan world runs after such things. And your father knows that you need them. Here's the culmination. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. That's the challenge. That's Jesus speaking to you and me. God has got you. He'll take care of you. You need to seek his kingdom. Not your own kingdom. Not your own life. Seek what he wants for your life. And, and that's a whole other sermon. Get with someone that says, hey, how can I seek God? How can I seek God's kingdom? What can I, how can I do that in my life? That's my challenge for you this week. Grab someone and just have a cup of coffee or go somewhere or just on a prayer walk and talk about that. Because that's what God wants for us to do. He'll take care of everything else. You're like, well, really? Is he going to pay these bills? He'll take care of it. Because the issue is not you need more money. It's your discipline. Right? So if you seek his kingdom, someone's going to tell you that, and then you're like, oh, I need to be disciplined, and then the bills are paid, right? That's how it works. Not saying, I'm not going to go to church or go to midweek because I need to get more hours. You're just going to be more undisciplined, and you get to bigger barns. Seek God's kingdom. That's what he wants from us. If you are studying the Bible and you're visiting with us, I'm glad you're here. I want to challenge you. To get in the Bible study, I plead with you to save yourself from this corrupt generation. And if you don't believe it's corrupt, just go on Twitter and see what's trending. Seriously, seriously. I mean, it's just horrible things. 
You know, there was another situation of a mom killing her, her, her kids in suicide, murder-suicide. Just happened last week. I mean, it's a corrupt generation. I plead with you, stay the Bible. And if you're a Christian, I want to challenge you. What in the world are you doing with your life? If you're like, Richard, I'm doing great. Amen. Grab the person next to you and bring them along with you. But if you're like me, constantly struggling just to wake up before my kids do, I just want to challenge you. Live your life for God. Seek his kingdom. You will be happier. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And I want my life to be a legacy the way uh, Bob's was. And here's someone whose life was demanded. And he has an incredible life. And we'll see it. You know, this coming TPAC. We'll see his life at his memorial. That's how I want to go out. Not going out holding on to money. Like, I want to go out just saying, I've given you everything. I've poured myself out. I was a living sacrifice. And I hope for that for us, that we can live lives like Jesus, not building bigger barns, but living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. Thank you. Yeah.